How many possible curves intersect all these points? Well, the answer may seem simple. After all, these points trace out the shape of a graph. So, just that graph, right? Well, in math, your intuition can often be wrong. What if there was some different continuous function that behaved so erratically that it hit all these points? It turns out that no function like this can exist. But why is that? It's because the first coordinate of all these points are rational numbers. These are numbers of the form p over q, where p and q are integers. In other words, they're every fraction. These numbers behave very strangely in the real number line. If you plot them, they appear to be everywhere. But there are still numbers that are not rational, like the square root of 2. These are the irrational numbers, which is every number you can't write as a fraction. The rational numbers are infinite, and so is its complement, the irrational numbers. But what's very strange is that there are different sizes of infinity. In particular, there are more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers, even though they are both infinite. This makes this next fact somewhat surprising. If you have two continuous functions, f and g, that are equal on the rational numbers, then they are equal everywhere. More explicitly, this means that if f of p over q is equal to g of p over q for every rational number, then f of x is equal to g of x for every real number x. This is interesting because there are more numbers that are not rational than numbers that are. Yet somehow, if two continuous functions are equal on every rational number, then they will be equal on the infinite amount of numbers that are not rational. In this video, I want to cover a proof of this very fact. But first, what does it even mean for two functions to be equal? Take a look at the two functions, absolute value of x and square root of x squared. Although these are defined differently, these are actually the same function. Here's a graph of the square root of x squared. It looks awfully similar to the graph of absolute value of x. This is because for every input, these functions give the same output. We say that two functions are equal at a point if that point gives the same output for both functions. Visually, this means that the graphs of the functions intersect at that point. Now for a function to be equal everywhere, they need to intersect at every point, or give the same graph. This means no matter what value we input, we will always get the same output for both functions, f and g. Now to prove that two functions are equal can be quite a cumbersome task. You have to show that no matter what input you plug into the functions, they will always give the same output. This can be quite difficult, especially when there's an infinite amount of inputs. Wouldn't it be nice if we only had to check a small subset of all possible inputs to show that two functions are equal? Meaning that if the functions are equal on this small subset, then the functions are equal on every possible input. Here's an example. Let's say f and g are constant functions, meaning f of x is equal to a and g of x is equal to b. The graph of these functions are horizontal lines, meaning if they are equal at one point, then they must intersect at one point. And if they intersect at one point, then they will intersect at every single point. This lets us ask the question, when are continuous functions equal? Well, as we saw before, if continuous functions are equal on the rational numbers, then they are equal everywhere. Let's take a look at how to prove this. Before we embark on a proof, we need a formal definition of what a continuous function is. For the sake of this video, our functions will be from the real numbers to the real numbers, meaning it inputs real numbers and outputs real numbers. Very informally, a continuous function is any function whose graph you can draw without picking up your pencil. This eliminates functions that have a jump in them, where there's a sudden change in value. It also eliminates functions where there's an asymptote. This also rules out any function with strange oscillatory behavior. We'll use the intuition from these examples to build a formal definition of continuity. The way we'll do this is by using limits. Let's use limits to show that this function has a sudden jump and is therefore not continuous. We can create a sequence of points, x1, x2, and so on, on the x-axis that converges to the value where our function has this jump. We can then apply the function to all of these points, 
This gives us a new sequence of points that lies on the graph of our function. Using the graph, we can see that the limit of our sequence xn is equal to 0. Similarly, the limit of our sequence f of xn is equal to 1. If we apply our function to the point 0, we get negative 1, which is not equal to 1. Therefore, we can see that if we apply our function f and then take the limit, it is not equal to taking the limit and then applying our function f. If we instead require this to be equal, then the jump discontinuity at x equals 0 cannot happen, and our function will be continuous. To put this simply, a function is continuous if whenever we have a limit like this, you can pull the f outside the limit without changing the value. Similarly, you could pass f inside the limit without changing the value. Although there are many other equivalent definitions of continuity, this one will be most useful for this video. The first step in our proof is to show that the rational numbers are dense within the real number line. But what does this mean to be dense? As we saw before, most numbers on the real number line are not rational. But if we plot every single rational number, they appear to take up the entire line. This is where the word dense comes from. Here's the actual definition. For any two distinct real numbers, there will always be a rational number in between them, no matter how close these numbers are. To prove this, we'll start by proving a few smaller things that will help us along the way. The first of which is this statement. If x and y are real numbers, with x minus y greater than 1, then there exists an integer a such that y is less than a, which is less than x. This makes a lot of sense if you look at it visually. Here's the number line, with every integer in purple. And here's a number x, with every number a distance 1 from x colored in red. You'll see, no matter where we place x, there is always some integer within this interval. Now, since y minus x is greater than 1, y must be somewhere outside this interval. And therefore, there is some integer in between y and x. The next fact we want to prove is the Archimedean property, which says that for every real number x, there exists a positive integer n such that x is less than n. This seems fairly obvious. After all, you can just round your number up to the nearest positive integer. For our proof, we're interested in an equivalent form of this property which is not as obvious. It says that for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a positive integer n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. Here, epsilon is meant to be an incredibly small positive number. So what this statement is saying is that the sequence of numbers 1 over n, where n is a positive integer, gets infinitely small. Let's prove this real quick. We'll start by letting epsilon be any number greater than 0. Now we'll consider the number 1 over epsilon. If epsilon is small, then 1 over epsilon will be very large. Because of the Archimedean property, we know that there is some integer n such that 1 over epsilon is less than n. We can manipulate this expression by flipping the fractions and reversing the inequality sign to get epsilon is greater than 1 over n. So there we go. No matter how small epsilon is, there is always a 1 over n smaller than it. To recap, we have these two facts. If x minus y is greater than 1, then there's an integer between x and y. Also, we have that if epsilon is greater than 0, then there is an integer n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. We can now put these two facts together to prove that if y is less than x, then there is a rational number p over q with y is less than p over q, which is less than x. Start by letting x and y be real numbers with x less than y. Since x is less than y, we can subtract x from both sides and get 0 is less than y minus x. We'll set this equal to epsilon. Now, we know that there is some integer n such that 1 over n is less than epsilon. Therefore, 1 over n is less than y minus x. Here, we can multiply both sides by n to get 1 is less than n times y minus n times x. Now, we can apply one of those two facts from before to show that there is an integer m between n times x and n times y. So, we can divide both sides by n and get x is less than m over n, which is less than y. Here, m over n is a rational number. Therefore, any two real numbers always have a rational number in between them.
With all this, we can finally prove that if f and g are equal on every rational number, then they are equal on every real number. We'll start by letting x equal any real number. Consider the sequence of numbers, x plus 1, x plus 1 half, x plus 1 third, and so on, where the general term is defined by x plus 1 over n. Because x and x plus 1 over n are distinct numbers, we know that there is a rational number in between them. We'll call this q sub n. Therefore, for every n, we have the inequality. x is less than q sub n, which is less than x plus 1 over n. Now here's the interesting part. We'll take the limit of everything in this expression. The key observation is that the left-hand side and right-hand side both converge to x. So we have the limit of the q sequence is sandwiched in between x, which means it must converge to x. Now we can bring in our continuous functions f and g. To evaluate them at x, we'll substitute in this limit for x. Now remember, these functions are continuous, so we can pass them inside the limit. Now, because qn is a rational number, by our assumption, f and g must be equal for every qn. Therefore, these two sequences are the same, so their limit must be equal. Because these limits are the same, we form this string of equalities. Therefore, f of x must be equal to g of x. And there we go, we have proved it. This holds for any arbitrary real number x. This is because our choice of x was arbitrary at the start. I'd like to finish off this video with an application to linear functions. A function is linear if you can split it up with respect to addition. This means that f of x plus y is equal to f of x plus f of y. Since any function with this property is called linear, you would expect its graph to look like a straight line. That's actually true, but how can we prove it? First, we can show that any function like this must intersect the origin, 0, 0. We can use this cool trick to evaluate f of 0. First, notice that f of 0 plus 1 is equal to f of 0 plus f of 1. But that left-hand side is just f of 1. Now, we can subtract f of 1 from both sides to get 0 is equal to f of 0. So we would expect any function with this property to be equal to c times x where c is the slope of this line. However, showing this fact can be very challenging because we're given very little information about the function. To evaluate a function at a point, the only thing we can do is split it up into pieces that we do know the value of. But for any given real number, the points we should split it up into are not obvious at all. The method we'll use to get around this is to simply evaluate our function at a rational point and show that it is equal to c times that rational number. This works because f is a continuous function. To start, we can see that p over q can be split up into 1 over q added together p many times. Now, because our function is linear, we can split this up into f of 1 over q added together p many times. This is simply equal to p times f of 1 over q. Now, all that's left to do is to evaluate f of 1 over q. We can do this by splitting 1 into 1 over q added together q many times. And again, we can use the linear property of the function to split this up into f of 1 over q q many times. Therefore, f of 1 is equal to q times f of 1 over q. Dividing both sides by q gives us f of 1 times 1 over q is equal to f of 1 over q. So we can plug this into our top equation. If we move our p to the top of this fraction, we get a very nice equation. The only thing that's missing is our constant c. Well, f of 1 will actually be equal to our c value. This makes sense because f of 1 would be the value of our slope. So we can say that f of p over q is equal to c times p over q for every single rational number. Now, because every linear function is continuous, f of x must be equal to c times x for every real number x. This is just one of the very cool applications of the rational numbers, and I encourage you to look into them more. Thank you for watching this video.